Today on Locked On Red Wings, should Detroit sign Patrick Kane and finishing up our hopes for the Detroit Red Wings prospects this season and long term. Your Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Locked On Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. I'm a podcast producer for the Daily J, a WWJ news radio podcast. Well, Scott is a host over at Locked On Tigers, as well as a freelance journalist for the Detroit News. And today's episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on NHL or enter promo code locked on NHL for a free water bottle with any order. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. We promise you that. Scotty Bentley. It's me. I, I said your name wrong. I said call no, dude. Scotland. That's that's my on my birth certificate. <laughs> I sometimes call you Scotland when I'm DMing people for crossovers. I'm like, <laughs> let me check with Scotland real quick. Nice, nice. I didn't know that. So yeah, now you do. Now everyone does. <laughs> uh, how you doing? How's your Labor Day, buddy? It was good, man. I uh, spent the entire day doing fantasy football drafts. I was in four fantasy. I'm in four fantasy leagues, and all four drafted on Labor Day. Somehow, none of them overlapped, which I think is super impressive. Just like by coincidence, <laughs> like I'm not in charge of all of them or whatever. So, um, yeah. How about you? I spent the day playing Legend of Zelda: Tears of the Kingdom, like literally from 11 a.m. until about 10 p.m. That's pretty much. No, right. I, I'm sorry. I stopped to lick envelopes for Allison. We were we were addressing some of the save the dates nice well that sounds super on brand for for both parties here so mm -hmm. yeah the, the glue the, the taste of glue it gets to you after a yeah, while yeah that'll get so, you man that gets you uh but on today's episode guys we're gonna talk about first here in segment one we're gonna address these patrick kane to detroit rumors that are circulating on social media uh then also we're gonna finish off our prospects hopes long term and short term uh this episode we got william wallander albert johansson carter mazer and cross hannis on monday's episode we went over cosa lombardi danielson and pelica so if you want to hear our thoughts on our hopes for them go back and listen to that episode and then last week we did longer kind of previews on soderblom casper and edvinson drew a blank there for a second but like i said we're going to start off talking about patrick kane because some Rumors started circulating on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it uh, this past week. And of course, as soon as I click on it, it goes away. But John Dietz, who is a beat writer for the Daily Herald for the Blackhawks, the Bears, and I believe the Cubs, uh, said that there is interest from Patrick Kane to join Alex Dabrinkit in Detroit should he become healthy. But it would take then, obviously... Steve Eiserman to extend the olive branch of mutual interest. This came after a report that uh, Patrick Kane's recovery from his hip resurfacing surgery is progressing on track, if not ahead of schedule. But Patrick Kane also said in the Associated Press article that he was going to stay on course regardless of where he is at, according to his doctors, because he doesn't want to rush this. And so now all of Red Wing's Social media can't stop talking about the idea of Patrick Kane coming to Detroit. And Scotty, in my opinion, that is a I have a very I have very many mixed thoughts on that. There are some things that give me pause and some things that excite me with the idea. I think if you asked me three months ago when we talked a little bit about it briefly, uh, if I wanted Patrick Kane to Detroit, I would have said, hell no. Um, but now I'm a little bit more like I, I'm a little bit more open to the idea of it, but I'm still leaning. No, where do you, where do you land on this? Yeah, I, I think that um, I have a lot of mixed emotions uh, about it as well. It's, um, it's, it's, <laughs> there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot to sort through with it. Um, I, I mean, I, I first off, I, I guess from a pure just is there a fit on this roster for a player uh, that is of his caliber? I think that that's somewhat of a question mark. Uh, not that there's the wings are in a position to be like rejecting potential high end talent, but uh, major injury mid 30s and his last season was not 
on the same par as like the previous, you know, decade, (laughs) Um, you know, like, I mean, there was certainly a clear step down even before like the injury completely knocked him out. So just from that perspective, uh, I I know that we had talked already before and and you had mentioned like, he's probably going to get a one-year deal wherever he ends up. I I, I agree with that sentiment. I find it hard to believe that any team out there is really going to commit multiple years to Patrick Kane. Um, I think that the style isn't, I mean, like there's always, you know, playmakers, there's always room for playmakers. And like this team is still like in a position where they kind of need goal scoring. So I'm not sure that the playmaker first style is something they should like really go out of their way to add right before training camp starts. Like, is it that much of a need that you really need to add this in September? Um, I, I think that that's a question. Um, and then, I mean, I guess that's kind of everything on the ice. I'm sure you'll have some some points to bring up too. But and then there's you know obviously the the off the ice uh, things that that have happened, uh, situations that have happened. Obviously, that happened with the Blackhawks. Uh, and and people debate until they're blue in the face about what <laughs> he he did or or did not know. Obviously, right? And uh, now you're talking about going out of your way to bring someone surrounded with that controversy is the word surrounded with that situation and controversy uh, into this organization. And you know, is that something that uh, that you want to do? Period. Uh, uh, you know, no matter how talented or not talented he is. So, um, yeah, there's certainly a lot of different angles to uh, to kind of attack here. I'm kind of in the camp of of no, just from, again, like the fit isn't an overwhelmingly like, oh, yeah, this is great. And um, just kind of everything else is kind of uh, if not even the talent on the ice. If everything else that comes with it is the nail in the coffin in a vacuum, then the on the ice certainly isn't enough to to sway my mind there yeah the like first and foremost like the kyle beach stuff right what happened to him was absolutely awful and you know he claims patrick kane knew obviously the whole team is going to be like we didn't know but like that controversy is going to follow patrick kane no matter where he goes yeah for the rest of his career if you're inviting patrick kane on the roster that is inherently you're going to invite criticism for that. If we're talking about Patrick Kane as a player himself, there's still other things to be concerned about as well. And it has to do with the fact that like two years ago, he scored 92 points and he looked great. And he's been saying this hip injury has been hindering him for a few years. Probably is part of the reason why he only had 57 points last year, at the Chicago Blackhawks slash New York Rangers. Also part of the fact that the Blackhawks were just God awful last year. They have Connor Bedard now. Um, but I'm a little bit hesitant with the controversy, you know, plus him being 34 years old, coming off of a major hip surgery because hip resurfacing surgery is no like laughing matter. It's not like you can, you know, not many people come back from hip resurfacing and are the same. And he was already showing signs of slowing down and whether or not that's because of age or because of the injury, there is a question mark about how much productivity he could bring the Detroit Red Wings at his age with that, you know, surgery having been done. Plus he's not going to be hundred percent healthy until halfway through the season, but until like the new year's or trade deadline anyways. So you wouldn't want to sign him until he's actually ready to play anyhow. But that gives me pause because you don't know what kind of Patrick Kane you're getting. But then the argument is, is half of Patrick Kane still better than most of your roster? There's an argument to be made that that is the case. You know, 57 points last year and 78 games played still would have put him at like, what, third on our team in point, third on the Red Wings in points scored? You know, and that's a guy who's playing injured. You So there's an argument to be made that, you know, get him on a one-year deal. You know, if he can go back to being like a 60 to 70 point player where he's getting 40 to 50 assists. Like he had 66 assists in his 92 because he's he is in his prime. He was the NHL's best playmaker. There's no arguing that. And you put him yeah. back with Debrinket and you put him with Dylan Larkin. I even if he's half as good as he once was, I can't necessarily argue that he probably would be one of the, you know, still a top line player on this team. But my other question is, is you know, that John Dietz said that he wants to re, you know reunite with Alex Debrinket, but why would he want to come to Detroit 
besides that, you know, like unless they're just such close friends and he in the twilight of his career, he just wants to have fun with his friends. I guess that's fair enough. But you think a guy at his age who's made as much money as he had, granted, he has won three Stanley Cups, but would still be ring chasing. He would go to a Tampa Bay or a Boston or an Edmonton or a Toronto, even though they have no cap space, but they keep signing guys anyways, a Florida, a Vegas, you know, a team to ring chase because he's in the twilight of his career, you would think. So, you know, I, I just, there is red flags with him. Yeah. I, I just, I, I, I don't see it as like a necessary ad. Like it's September. Like I, Definitely not now. Right. Like, I I just, I, right. I I mean, I guess, sure. sure. You know, when the, when the injury is done, I guess that that's when the timeline would happen. But like, you even like, I don't know. I I just, I I don't, I don't see it as like a, like a necessity for the wings. I don't see it as like such an overwhelmingly like, oh yeah, that's like painfully obvious. The wings should obviously do that. Um, He would be like a trade deadline acquisition, so to speak. Right. Yeah. And like, then, you know, I mean, he has, is he just going to come out and he's just going to play like 22 a night off rip? Like, no, No. like I, I just, I, I don't know. I, I I don't understand the the point. I don't understand really the fit for the wings, to be honest with you. I don't really understand the point. And I'm again, as I said earlier, even just not even including really the, um, you know, like how he fits into this team, like on the ice, I'm not like really yeah. <laughs> clamoring or like going you know, to pound my fist on the table to bring Patrick Kane into the organization anyway. So, yeah, I mean, like overall, I don't think there's a need either. That's why I like, I'm still leaning. No, because this roster's already full and you know, he's not the Patrick Kane that he once was even coming off of surgery. I highly doubt he'll ever return to 92 point form. I could be wrong. I've been wrong plenty of times before, but I just doubt he will be. So, I mean, overall, I'm still leaning to the side of no. Like, I still don't think he's a necessary addition. And I don't think if the Red Wings are at the position, like, I think you brought up a great point there at the end. Like, come trade deadline when he is finally healthy. I'm I, We're just throwing trade deadline out there. He could be healthy around New Year. Like, you sign him, what is his role going to be? He's not going to come in and play, you know, 18 minutes off rip. Like you said, they're going to have to ease him into it, I think. So, I think you bring up a good point. And overall, I, I still lean no. Over, uh, on adding Patrick Kane, but I just want, we just wanted to address it because it's been circulating on social media. Got to talk to you guys today about bird dogs. We've been talking to you guys a ton about bird dogs lately and their most recent offer. They gave you a free hat. In fact, I got to update the flare at the bottom because it's no longer a free hat. You get a free water bottle now, but bird dogs, they send us some product. I try it on. I fall in love. The shorts that they've been sending us guys are comfortable and they can be used in any circumstance. It was Allison's birthday the other day. We headed over to her sister's for a nice family gathering. You know what I was wearing, Scotty? Bird dogs. I sure as hell was wearing my bird dog shorts because when it comes to casual wear, nothing triumphs like bird dogs. They're the king of comfortability. They're the king of versatility. They're the king of not having to wear actual underwear because it's built in to the underwear. You can wear them wherever you want. I've worn them to the gym. I've worn them in the lake to put the boat in the water coming up soon. I'm going to be taking the boat out of the water. So I'm going to be wearing bird dogs for that again, too. And you can wear them out on date nights because they look so nice that you think they're just khaki shorts. They are just great all around shirt shorts and you can get sweatpants as well. They sent us some of that. They got hats. They got water bottles. They got mugs like Yeti style mugs. They got it all. So go to birddogs.com slash Locked on NHL or enter promo code locked on NHL at checkout for a free bird dogs water bottle with your order. That's birddogs.com slash locked on NHL for a free water bottle at checkout. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. We promise you that. Segment two locked on Red Wings podcast. Yes, we know we're a little late getting into the prospect thing, but we're just going to ride that Patrick Kane train until we ran out of breath because it was all that anyone could talk about. Uh, the last couple of days, but now we're going to move into our prospect hopes for the season and long term. We got four more guys we wanted to address, Scotty, because we're kind of over already in time. Let's merge our Albert Johansson and William Wallander talk. Uh, William Wallander, Wallander last year with the SHL Rogla had 26 points in 50 games played. Uh, he came over to Grand Rapids at the end of the season, played just one game. Albert Johansson, on the other hand. Um, played all of last year with the Grand Rapids Griffins, had 53 games, played 15 points, ended the season injured. Steve Eiserman said 
he probably would have gotten a look at the NHL at the end of the season had he not been hurt. Scotty, what are our hopes for Johansson and Wallander short term and then long term? What do we think that we got in these guys? Yeah, it's interesting, man. I I think I mean, like you said, there was like really, you know, people were pretty much under the impression and and Eisman all but confirmed it that um, or I guess all did confirm it uh, that uh, Johansson was going to get a look in uh, in Detroit last year if he didn't get hurt. I, I think that. I mean, best case scenario is uh, for Johansson, especially like he does so well that if slash when an injury happens on the blue line, he's in the conversation to get called up and everybody's confident in it. I know that uh, Edvinson is obviously going to be in that conversation, too. Uh, but I, I think I don't know, like multiple injuries certainly have happened before and will happen again. Hockey's a physical sport and we're certainly going to have to deal with that at some point. I think best case scenario is he gets his feet wet in, in Detroit this year. Oh, well, I guess that's more Johansson than Wallander, but I guess Wallander is kind of in that a, a similar breath at least. Yeah. I think Johansson uh, is closer to the NHL level than William Wallander is having played only, nearly a full season, three quarters of a season at of professional hockey in North America. Cause there is an adjustment period and some guys skip that adjustment period. Lucas Raymond skipped the adjustment period, came right to the NHL. Um, but, I don't think William Wallander is Lucas Raymond caliber of talent. Not to say he's not talented. He was a second round pick at the very beginning of the second round and had people had him projected going in the first round. But I think when it comes to Albert Johansson, this is a guy that I don't think makes the roster out of camp, but I think gets looks at the NHL level at the very minimum. He gets that nine games played at the end of the season, but I think he could get a promotion if long-term injuries or just, you know, forces his way on the roster. I think there is a reality that, you know, this is a year he earns a spot at the NHL level in some capacity, whether it be a temporary role or a full-time role. William Wallander, I think, is going to need to marinate in the AHL for one more year, uh, but, you know, could possibly get that nine-game look as well if injuries suit themselves uh, in his favor by the end of the season. So, I mean, I, both these guys are, are getting really close to the NHL level. Albert Johansson, in my opinion, especially. But William Wallander, not that much farther behind. But long-term, Scotty, I mean, I think both of them are probably ceilings for both of them, like second pair. But I think oh, probably more than likely going to be like third pair guys. Uh, I could see Albert Johansson being a second pair guy. I, it's hard to tell with these guys who are, are taken outside the first round where they'll be, but I can, I can see them. I mean, I definitely see them both being mainstays on the NHL roster. It's just where they'll be. I guess the cop out is to say second and third pair for sure. I don't think any higher than that though. Yeah, I agree. I think that they're, they're bottom four, but like, you know, bottom four is still in, you know, second pair is included in bottom four. Like that's not a, that's not a, uh, like nothing. Um, I, I think that, uh, yeah, I agree with you. I think that that would be great. And, and you know, we, we talk about all these prospects and, like, it's important to remember, like, the <laughs> the likelihood of, like, all of these dudes being, like, middle six, bottom four, like, players is is slim. Like, some of them won't work out. And so the fact that the Wings have so many defensemen that we're excited about that we're going to throw at the wall – the likelihood of, of more than one of them sticking is solid. And so I, I, I mean, I don't have the utmost confidence that, you know, like Edvinson, Johansson and Wallander are all going to be like mainstays on the Red Wings for the next like decade. I think that's probably uh, a little far fetched, but in the same breath, I, I, I'm very confident that the ceiling between those two guys is a solid bottom four defenseman. And um, if even one of them turns into that, I think that's a big win. I mean, it's also worth noting that William Wallander was no slouch in the SHL last year. He won Young Player of the Year from the European Hockey Alliance or something like that. Third straight Red Wing prospect to win it uh, as well. And he has over he was over half a point a game in yeah. S, in the SHL playing with men. Like that's pretty pretty substantial. Yeah, oh yeah. So William Wallander is a solid prospect. He, you know, they both have that ceiling of being second pair guys, and that's a good thing. That's a good problem that Red Wings have, where they have a lot of guys who have ceilings of second pair or top pair uh, defensive prospects, Edvinson being top pair. And then obviously Johansson and Wallander being second pair. So 
I'm really excited for both these guys, and I hope that we, one, if not both of these guys, get look, looks at the NHL level and maybe even pushes their way on the roster. I mean, if they're pushing one of these guys off the team or into a gondola at Little Caesars Arena, that means that they're playing better than guys who have been veterans in the year in the league for years. Right. Yeah, so I'm definitely for that. Uh, we're going to take another quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about Carter Mazur and Cross Hannis, two guys that we are really excited about on the forward side of things. So stay tuned to Locked on Red Wings. Segment three, Locked on Red Wings podcast. Scotty, do you want to talk about Hannis or Mazur first? Um, let's do, let's do Hannis. Hannis, Cross Crease, Hannis. What yes. was the other one we called him? That's Chris Cross. One. Cross ice. Something Cross ice, Hannes. Of, we, yeah, we everybody called him that. Uh, well, I'm just going what we used to, what we were calling him last year during the prospects tournament. Right. Uh, oh, right. Yeah. I forgot about that. Wow. Fake fan. Hannes got his graduation to professional hockey last season. He played 30 games with the Grand Rapids Griffins, being over half a point a game, 17 points in 30 games, nine goals, eight assists before being injured and not playing. So he kind of got overlooked, I think, a lot by a lot of Red Wings fans as an exciting prospect because he spent so much time out. This is another guy, I mean, short term for him, go back to Grand Rapids, stay healthy and continue to, your development because if you continue to play like this or even better than this, I think he'll find his way to the Detroit Red Wings roster, not this year, but you know, maybe push for a roster spot next year. Yeah, I agree, man. Well, I, I think that... I think that that's a nice, like in, in terms of timeline, that that's like a nice place to put. Honestly, a lot of these guys, I, I think that that's kind of a nice area to put them in. But um, yeah, I think that if he, best case scenario is he really establishes himself this year. And then next year around this time, we're having the same conversation. And within it, we're talking about like the likelihood of him getting a legitimate look at the NHL that year. Yeah, absolutely. And like long term, where do we sit, see him? Uh, it's tough. This is a guy that I really have a hard time predicting long term. Um, ceiling, see him as a you know middle six winger at the NHL level. Um, floor, doesn't make the NHL at all. It's really hard to tell. Uh, he only has half a season in professional hockey. He was really good at the Portland Winterhawks in the WHL the year before that but it's really hard to tell. So I, I always lean to what their ceilings are long-term. I think middle six wingers, that ceiling. But, I mean, the floor on this guy is going to be a lot lower than it is on, like, some of your higher-tier prospects. Like Marco Casper's floor is, like, bottom six center. His ceiling is, like, top six center. So, like, the disparity there is a lot bigger. I could see Hannes being a top six winger, but I could definitely see him not being that either. <laughs> yeah, I, I... <laughs> it's harder to predict some of these guys, you know? For sure. Well, I mean, you know, similar with, um, well, honestly, I guess there's a few now that I'm thinking about it. But yeah, like there's a few that are either far enough away or just like haven't, you know, played enough in the, like in, in North America for some of these guys, like in the AHL. Like there, there's definitely a lot of disparity there. I, yeah, I would say a successful year is just um, raising the floor, I think. Right. Like we, we, I'm, we, I talk all the time about ceilings and floors, right? Like I, I think that this year, a, a good year would be, would be raising the floor and making it so that, okay, like he played well enough to where at a minimum, people are confident that this dude can make the NHL. We can debate the, you know what I mean? We can debate the ceiling. We can debate how, uh, the, the heights that he could reach, but, uh, I think if he gets to a point where people are like, okay, like relatively soon, this dude's going to make the league. I think that that would be a pretty successful year. Yeah. I mean, if we're talking, you want a point total for a guy like Cross Hannis, if he can be half point per game, like he sure. was last year before the injury, sure. I think that's a successful season, play a full season, be a half point per game. You know, he usually is pretty close in his splits. Although that year at the winter Hawks, he had 60 assists and 26 goals outside of that. He's been pretty close with the splits. I, I mean, that would make me very happy. So, For sure, I agree. Um, moving on to Carter Mazur. Now, this is a guy who Red Wings fans in general are really excited about. Uh, third round pick in 2021, uh, left wing, played with the University of Denver the last two years, won a ship, uh, had 37 points in 40 games with Denver last year, 22 goals, 15 assists. I think this is a guy that Red Wings fans look and see as like a potential candidate, like a dark horse candidate to make the roster coming out of camp. He, after his 
season ended with Denver. He went to Grand Rapids last year, had six points in six games to finish the season, three goals and three assists. So he went to transition to professional hockey and immediately was on fire. Now, how much of that was just like starting off hot before inevitable cool down? I don't know. But can he continue? If he continues that over in the training camp and prospects tournament, you know, is there a reality where he makes the team out of camp? I think it's a long shot. But is there a reality where he's knocking on the door during throughout the season? I think it's there. This season? Knocking on the door throughout the season? Sure. I don't hate it. Yeah, I, I think I, that really uh, I think that it would take it would take a, a pretty solid year. Um, but like for as much as we've talked about like, oh, who are the wings gonna dip? like what pool are they gonna dip into? when injuries on the blue line happen, we haven't really had the same discussion with the forward core. And uh, I think that he is probably in the back end, maybe of that conversation. If he plays, you know, the better he plays, then the more he'll come to the forefront. But that's something I've, I hadn't really thought about, you know, like I said, we've been talking about it a lot with the, just because of how deep organizationally D man is. But um, I, I guess I hadn't really thought about, you know, when injuries happen in the forward core, who's going to get called up. And well, um the one thing I would add to that, though, is you got to be careful with some of these guys because if you call them up, the clock is ticking. Yeah, for because sure. Because you can't entry level slide Mazer because he's too old. Right. So if you're going to call Mazer up, you got to call Mazer up and like be ready to start playing him soon. That's why NHL rosters have guys they sign like Austin Zarnick and Matt Luff who they can call up when injuries happen. So I don't think he'll be the first or even second guy to get called up because you still have Luff and Zarnick. You have guys like Tim Gettinger and you know, Nolan Stevens down there in the NH or the Grand Rapids Griffins who you could bring up before that. So there's plenty of guys who, you know, are on this roster that are probably going to be first calls that you don't have to start the clock on. I think the only situation where Carter Mazur gets called up is if one, an injury happens and two, he legitimately looks like he is NHL ready because you bring him up and he plays one game and boom, the clock's ticking. So that's got to be a decision that they knowingly make saying that he is ready for the NHL level, so let's call him up and start the clock. Is a big deal. Yes. like but, that, that means that they're going to hesitate. They're going to wait. Mm -hmm. But I, I do can. think, and that's why I don't think he makes the team out of camp either, because I think they're going to see how he performs in Grand Rapids before making that decision. But I do think that all season long, he has the potential to knock on that door. Now, long term, it's the same thing with Cr Cross Hannis. I think middle six winger. You know, I think that, his ceiling is middle six winger, but there's a lot of guys in the Red Wings pool who, when you talk ceilings can have that ceiling. It's their floors that where that disparity again, that disparity is, and they could fall anywhere in the middle. Like he could be a guy who's really great at the college level, but can never figure it out, you know, good enough at the NHL level to make it full time. So when I say long-term his ceiling is middle six, you take that with a bigger grain of salt than you would with again, a Nate Danielson or a Marco Casper. There's a reason why Mazur was taken in the third round and not in the first round. Although I love him to death and I think he's for real. I think he's legit. Steve Eiserman is, you know, if Steve Eiserman is name dropping you uh, in a press conference, then that probably means you're on his radar. I would agree. So, um, geez, any final thoughts, man? I don't think so. We ball. We do ball. Uh, we'll be back with a new episode on Friday. So stay tuned for that. Same time, same place. It's your team every day. Every day. Every day.